The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today, This scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke highly of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They also asked, Is this not the son of Joseph? He said to them, Surely you will quote me the proverb, Physician, heal yourself, and say, Do here in your native place, The things that we heard were done in Capernaum. And he said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own native place. Indeed, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the sky was closed for three and a half years, and a severe famine spread over the entire land. It was to none of these that Elijah was sent, but only to a widow in Zarephath in the land of Sidon. Again, there were many lepers in Israel during the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not to one of them, not one of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. When the people in the synagogue heard this, they were filled with fury. They rose up, drove him out of town and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town had been built to hurl him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went away. The Gospel of the Lord. For my first homily this morning, since it's a day off for all of us, I must speak a little bit on Labor Day, that in creation, when God created man, he created him to work. And so this is a gift of God to be able to work. And yet, the labor of man was designed so that man could bring all creation into subjugation to give it glory to God. So it was all about giving glory to God. And strangely enough, as sin escalates, we are more interested in giving glory to the stuff of sin than to the glory of God. And so we get mixed up in our labor. And yet we can salvage that because each of us being called to work, every single one of us, no matter our age, or our position in life, in society, we can all work to glorify God. Every single one of us can do that. It's something that we can all have a hand in to participate in. And so it's up to us to first, the work, the primary work of God, which is why the Sabbath is the first day, the primary work of God is to worship him. And when we start there, it all unfolds how we can serve him better. Now, for my second homily, I'm not even going to try to pull the two things together because there's some interesting things here in the gospel. Jesus 
he comes into his hometown and he's at first he's graciously met this is in many many ways this is um, what happens as an entry level into people receiving receiving the gospel and so you hear people of all kinds of qualifications yes Jesus was a good teacher yes Jesus proposed a good morality. Jesus was a good person. He's a great model to look at. Okay? And so everybody's pretty safe when you talk along those lines. But when Jesus presents the truth and he identifies himself as the one who is the truth, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. As soon as he's identified as that, he begins to get people a little unnerved. They're gracious at, at him, but all of a sudden a question comes to their mind. And you could see the evil one beginning his work. Is this not the son of Joseph? His identity is questioned. As soon as you take Jesus out of, or you, as soon as you take him out of the minimalization of the good man and the holy prophet and anoint him the Messiah and God, that changes everything because he either is or he's not. And if he is, and something deep down inside of us knows that if he is God and it's true, and our whole insides start to stir, and we don't know how to handle that. Because if he's going to bring the truth, he wants us to be healed and whole. And so he's going to identify the sickness in us. And he's going to bring his surgical, spiritual scalpel, and we're not going to like it. And so our first response is to push him away. Is he not the son of Joseph? I have to tell myself he's not who he says he is because if I admit it, uh, then I'm going to have to give him permission to start doing his work in me. And so they say, physician, cure yourself. Do what you did in, your, in, in the other places. No prophet is accepted except in his native place. What's going on here? That question begins the entrance of allowing the evil one to begin hardening our hearts. And so, in a sense, it's, it's very similar to what Pharaoh did to Moses. He immediately questioned Moses' credentials in spite of all the signs and wonders. And so, questioning Jesus' credentials... Now we have the hard-heartedness. And that there's a spirit about that. It's a defensiveness. It brings up a wall. And there's even kind of no reason to it. You know, it, it, it's probably happened to everyone here. We know we've got to do something, but yet there's something that just doesn't allow us to really consent and give in to the mercy of God, a hard heartedness. And then the spirit of the accuser steps in. And the spirit of the accuser says, it's not my issue, it's yours, Jesus. The spirit of the accuser gets us to blame everybody else except me. It's most common with an addict. I'm going to pick on the men here because I, I think I have a little bit more experience dealing with addicts who have been men. If it wasn't for my wife, I wouldn't have a drinking problem. Or, you know, it's because of my boss that I've got to have three martinis after work. Really? Yeah, guy is nodding his head. Do you want me to have the fourth ready for you tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> And so we begin to look elsewhere to affix 
not only the blame, but we uh, look elsewhere to affix the culpability. It's somebody else's fault. It's their guilt, not mine. I believe I was trying to figure out where this was, but I, I read uh, a few years ago in the writings of John Paul II, he had a phrase called the masters of suspicion. It's where you point to the culpability of somebody else or you place culpability in them so you don't have to look at yourself and you become suspicious of them and get everybody to be suspicious of them so you're not suspicious of yourself. And now we have the spirit of denial. And it's, that's akin to lying. And where does this all go? Who's the father of lies? And so now I'm in a complete web of lies where I don't need Jesus. I don't need his accusations. But yet Jesus has not come to accuse. He has come to bring healing and hope. But first he has to demonstrate where the illness is, and he wants to do that. And so he has done this great favor of coming into his hometown, and he has identified the cancer in each soul of these people, and they don't want the treatment because they'd rather look away from the disease and blame somebody else. This is, the, this is the impasse to repentance. And perhaps it would be something to think about today. Is this something that Jesus is, is putting on our heart? Because what happens is this. Now, once you, once you go through all this, this denial and all this stuff, okay, this unrepentance, Something else follows. Look what happened with, with Pharaoh. He got more and more enraged and steeped in anger. I think it's amazing that he received 10 chances. You know, sometimes the parents say, you got three. Okay, Pharaoh received 10 chances to figure this out. But with each one, he got more enraged and more unrepentant. The fruit of that, again, this is right akin to the fires of hell, fury and anger. And so, you know, in our own spiritual lives, at the end of the day, um, it, it's, it's good to look at that stuff like that. You know, at the end of the day, where, where did anger show its face today? Because that's not of God. And was there a hint of fury and related stuff like that? These things are not of God. And that can lead us sometimes to see what is the little cancer that needs to be removed by surrendering it to the merciful Christ who desires to walk into the town of our heart and not necessarily to accuse us, but simply to tell us, where is the disease and how can I help? Regina, Jenny, Regina.